Thank you, Russ. So we all know that in today's business climate, as Russ was alluding to, things are, are getting increasingly competitive. We have all of these, these forces, all of this noise, frankly, coming at us. I mean, we live in a world where there's a, a thousand Facebook friends and LinkedIn connections and tweets coming at us. And so in this world, it, it's increasingly difficult for us as individual professionals or for our companies to really stand out amongst the competition. And so over the past couple of years, I wanted to try to crack that code to solve that problem. And so over, uh, over this period of time, I interviewed about 50 top thought leaders in a variety of different fields, everything from uh, business and productivity and technology to genomics and real estate and urban planning to try to understand what are the common denominators of the people who are really able to become recognized for their ideas and become recognized as the best in their field. What were they doing differently? What were they doing that other people were not? And so I want to share with you today some of what I learned in the course of, of researching and writing Stand Out. The, the first piece, and the subtitle of, of my book alludes to it, it's um, how to, how to uh, find your breakthrough idea and build a following around it, is ultimately there's two parts when it comes to having you as an individual or your company known as a thought leader in your field. The first is coming up with an idea that you're known for. How do you, how do you innovate? How do you keep the ball moving forward? And the second part, equally critical, is getting recognized for it. Because you know, none of us can afford to be the, the best kept secret or you know, the tree falling in the forest that, that nobody knows about. We have to start spreading the word. And so I'll start by talking about that piece a little bit, but the core of what I want to share with you guys today, um, because I know that you care about increasing your competitive advantage in the marketplace, is focused on how do we as companies come up with breakthrough ideas. So let's, let's start a little bit with the building of following. This is actually a blog post that I wrote uh, a while back for the Harvard Business Review. If you're serious about ideas, get serious about blogging. And I don't literally mean that, that everybody here has to start a blog, although I am bullish on them in general. Uh, but what, I'm, what I mean in general is that one of the things I learned in talking to these top thought leaders is that if we want to be known for our ideas, if we want to be known as innovators in our field, we cannot afford to shy away from sharing our ideas generously. We have to make sure that, like a beacon, we are putting our ideas out into the marketplace so that like-minded people and customers and potential customers can find us. That's actually the power of the internet and the power of content creation. I know you guys uh, recently heard from Jay Baer, uh, who's actually a, a friend of mine, the author of Utility, and you know, he frequently beats the drum about content marketing. And I, uh, I agree with it entirely. Um, in a world where we are just overcome with an onslaught of noise, the most powerful thing that we can do is find ways to communicate with our customers such that they want to hear from us, such that they are actively seeking it out and saying, yes, please, I would like more of this. And so if, if we can solve their problems, if we can uh, think about the, the questions that they have and create content that's relevant to that to attract them and draw them in proactively, that is incredibly powerful. I mean, as, as you guys know, because you are on the ground doing this every day. When I'm teaching at Duke, um, I like to talk to my students about how sales and marketing fit together. And, you know, in a lot of ways, sales and marketing is really a, a spectrum. I mean, people, you know, sometimes think of them as, as, you know, sales ampersand marketing. They're kind of one unit. But really, it's, it's two pieces that fit together. And the more marketing you do, the better your marketing is, the less sales you actually have to do. If your marketing is good enough, what sales looks like is the person saying, hey, I really want to buy this from you. And you say, oh yes, that sounds great. I'll send you a contract. 
If we want to make sales easier, we need to bring the customers to us. And that is what the power of ideas and sharing those ideas can do. So what does that actually look like in practice? In Standout, I, one of the people I interviewed was this guy. His name is Robert Scoble. And uh, if any of you are involved in, uh, in the technology or startup space, you may have heard of him. Um, he's considered an opinion leader in that field. He's a little bit like the Oprah of startups. If, uh, if Robert Scoble smiles on you or mentions you, it's like, oh, it's Scoble approved. So it's, it's pretty exciting. But one of the, the things that I was interested in when I talked to him, um, and perhaps many of you guys can relate, uh, he's a popular guy, and he gets hundreds and hundreds of emails a day. You know, his inbox is overwhelmed. And I asked him a little bit about how he deals with that. And he, he had a strategy that I thought was pretty powerful. He said, if people write to him and they have a question, he'll write back and he says, I'm glad to answer your question, but not on email. And the reason for that, he, t he tells them that they should write their question on Quora, which some of you guys may be familiar with. It's a question and answer website on the internet. And the reason he does it is he says, if I email someone the answer, I'm helping one person. But if I put the answer on the internet, I'm helping five people or 50 people or 500 people. And I think that's the way that we all need to start thinking. We don't literally necessarily need to start answering questions on Quora like Robert Scoble does. But the question is, in a busy world, in an overextended world, how do you get more leverage? How do you reach more people with your ideas and make sure that instead of doing the same one thing a million times with one-offs, we're actually getting scale and reaching the masses and letting ourselves be found? Because if someone is, is Googling some question or problem they have and they see that Robert Scoble has a great answer on Quora, it makes them dig deeper. It makes them say, who is this guy? Let me find out more. And that's something that we all want as companies. We want the customers coming to us. So if we can make ourselves the repository of ideas and of content, that is a powerful tool. This guy right here, um, as someone I profiled in Standout, he actually started as my employee about 10 years ago. I was uh, in a previous career iteration uh, before starting to, to write and teach. I ran a nonprofit for a couple of years. Uh, his name was Mike Lydon. And so we, we were a small nonprofit. We did not have much money at all. And so right out of college, I was able to hire Mike as my deputy for you know zero money, basically. And uh, he only stayed with us for about a year, but he was a great employee. I was really sad to see him go. And he, he left because he had a really clear vision of what he wanted to do. He wanted to be an urban planner. And so he went off to graduate school for that. And you know, I, I kept up with him a bit and followed what he was doing. Um, after he got his degree, he uh, got a junior level uh, position at one of the country's best urban planning firms. You know, did a great job with that, a, sort of apprenticed there, uh, spent about five years. And finally, in 2009, which as you guys will remember was not the most auspicious economic climate in the history of the world, uh, in 2009, he decided he wanted to start his own business. Now, it was, it was a pretty audacious move, particularly in an industry like urban planning, which is incredibly dependent on large government contracts. I mean, that's who buys urban planning services, is states and municipalities. And they were being hit harder than almost anyone in terms of declining tax revenue. But, so he knew that if he was going to make this work, he somehow had to distinguish himself. He somehow had to prove to these you know, very risk-averse entities that they should take a chance on a two-man company that was literally just getting started. So the strategy that he used that actually proved pretty effective, he had become fascinated as he was you know, going about his work, just you know, keeping an eye on trends, with a phenomenon that he, he actually came up with a name for it. It's called tactical urbanism. And basically, it was the beginnings of these sort of DIY efforts uh, when it comes to, uh, to urban planning issues. There would be uh, citizens that would 
take, take over uh, a parking space and would turn it into a miniature park. Or they would uh, they would actually paint bicycle lanes onto roads themselves, or take over an abandoned storefront and create a mural there. You know, these are things that didn't cost a lot of money, but were were interesting urban experiments that he kept seeing more and more of. And he said, you know, this is interesting. Let's let's explore this. Let's see what this looks like. And so he began compiling case studies. He wanted to put them together, and he gathered more and more. And eventually, he had enough that he decided to, uh, to put them into a book. And he didn't have fancy aspirations for it. He put them into a PDF file and stuck it on his website and let anyone who wanted it download it for free. Within a few months, however, he realized that 10,000 people had downloaded his free ebook, which particularly in the urban planning community, which is not huge, was a really significant number. He realized they were starting to get traction. So he went out and gathered more case studies. And he and his partner, a few months after that, created a second volume called Tactical Urbanism Volume 2. Put that up on their website. He started to get more and more pings, more and more inquiries. Before too long, an urban planning firm in South America reaches out to him and says, can we collaborate? Let's, let's do a volume just of South American case studies. So. They do that. They put that up on the website. It is now five years later, and the three ebooks together have been downloaded more than 160,000 times. Today, RFPs come to Mike and his firm, and they specifically say, We are looking for a firm with experience in tactical urbanism. Literally, the requests for proposals are being written with Mike and his company in mind. Now, he didn't have to get a book contract with a New York publisher. That's a nice thing to have. But he literally created a document and stuck it on his website. But because he was willing to keep his eye to the ground, to look at the trends that were emerging, to say, this is interesting. Let's explore it more. Because he was willing to share his ideas freely, he became known and associated for those ideas, and people began seeking him out. Ideas are the most powerful calling card of all for our companies. If you can have people coming to you because of it, if you can become so associated with it, it's almost like you own the term, it's almost like you own the idea, the innovation, then you are in a position like Mike, where people are literally writing proposals asking for you. But how, how do we actually come up with these ideas? What does that process look like? One of the things that I thought was most interesting in the course of doing my research was the story that I came upon of Daniel Goleman. Now, many of you guys may be familiar with his work. Um, 20 years ago, he wrote the groundbreaking blockbuster book, uh, Emotional Intelligence. The Harvard Business Review called it literally the singular, most important business idea of the 1990s. And I, you know, I, I had read the book. Daniel Goleman has built kind of a cottage industry about it. He's written a million spin-offs of the book. But I didn't, until I started writing Stand Out, know a lot about the story of how that came to be. I had assumed, actually, that he was some kind of a researcher and was just writing about his research. But it turns out that's not the case. He was a journalist, and one day he was reading a psychology journal as just part of his job. He was looking for story ideas. And as he was flipping through, he came across a very densely worded, rather boring article that contained in it a gem. As soon as he saw it, he realized how significant it was that this was an article overturning the primacy of IQ. For 50 years, IQ had been the measure in the public's imagination and even in the psychology literature of what a person's future success was going to be. And all of a sudden, he sees this, this report, this research that says, actually, no. Actually, there's something different. There's something more important than that emotional intelligence. He knew he was onto something. He knew that this was an idea that needed to be heard. And so he ended up writing about it first as a journalist and later with his book, which became a bestseller literally for years at the top of the New York Times. 
uh, bestseller list. Now, the reason that I think Daniel Goleman's story is so important is that, number one, a lot of people, you know, when, when we're talking about ideas, when I'm, you know, uh, coming out and giving speeches, sometimes people push back and they say, that's great, that's great, you know, yeah, of course, ideas are important, but that's for, that's for other people. I'm not an idea person. That's for the geniuses out there, the Einsteins, to come up with things. And I want to push back and say, Daniel Goleman didn't come up with the singular idea that he is known for. Daniel Goleman was someone who paid attention. He was someone who read, who looked around, who followed the landscape and said, that's interesting. And that is something that every single one of us can do. If we're going to take our companies forward into the next decade, if we're going to keep them successful and, and moving to the next level, we need to be on the lookout for ideas. If you could come up with them yourself, that's great. But something that, that could be even more critical is just having your antennae out and looking for anomalies, looking for the thing that is out there and is interesting, but isn't being recognized or talked about enough. The other thing that I think is interesting about what Daniel Goleman did is that he was reading a psychology journal. Now, this is not something that you do, uh, you know, in, in two minutes while you're standing in line. That is, that is an activity that takes some time and some effort and some concentration. And a lot has changed in the 20 years since Daniel Goleman discovered this concept. Largely, this. We're all carrying our phones, we're all flipping through, reading the Twitter feed, sending messages, checking texts, looking at our listicles on BuzzFeed. And that's great, but it doesn't necessarily lend itself to the kind of sustained reflection, the kind of sustained engagement with an article or with a book that can help spark those connections and enable us to find the ideas that really could be critical to our personal success and to our corporate success. So making that time for reflection, building it in, being deliberate about protecting it, I think is one of the essential things. So let's talk a little bit about this question of how we come up with these ideas, how we find these ideas. This is a gentleman named Eric Schott. Eric is actually a, a former consulting client of mine. And today he is recognized as one of the top scientists in the world. He's been profiled by almost every major media outlet. Esquire magazine has written literally not one but two different profiles about his work. He's made his mark in biology and has about 20, or sorry, about 200 uh, peer reviewed papers out there, everything from, from Alzheimer's to diabetes. But for me, what's most interesting about the fact that Eric is a leading biologist is that he didn't actually initially start his career studying biology. He was initially trained as a mathematician and a computer scientist. And part of why he has been able to make such a disproportionate impact in the world of biology is that in the late 1990s, when he was coming up and getting his doctorate, he was one of the first people that was able to really grasp the power, the nascent power of big data and how it could impact biology. At the time, it was very controversial. And a lot of the classically trained biologists said, what are we going to do with this? Why do we need this? This isn't real biology. But because he had that quantitative background, because he was comfortable with numbers and large sets of numbers in a way that most trained biologists were not, Eric could see the potential, and he dove into it head first. And there were, there were certainly uh, roadblocks for a long time. Uh, he, was, he was a lightning rod in the field. But today, in a lot of ways, he's won. 15 years later, we all understand the importance of big data. We all understand what it can show us and what it can do. But the reason that he saw it first is that he was not coming from an entrenched position. In the course of researching Standout, one of the things that I learned is that it is often very hard to innovate from the center. If you are steeped in the ideology of one company or one field, it can be very, very difficult to be able to tell the difference 
between doing something one way because it's always been done and doing something one way because it is the only way it could possibly be done. There's a big difference between those things. Because Eric had come from a different world, a different realm, he was able to see possibilities that others were not. And so for all of us, the question is, how can we bring in our different experiences? Whether it's training in different disciplines or having worked in different companies, maybe it's hobbies that we've cultivated over time or having a different cultural perspective than other people in the company. But how do we tap those pieces of ourselves that enable us to see things differently? Another example of this is one from this guy. Um, perhaps some of you have heard of him or read his book. His name is Eric Ries, yet another Eric. Um, Eric Ries was the author of a popular book a few years ago called The Lean Startup. And The Lean Startup has really become a phenomenon, uh, certainly in Silicon Valley, but also worldwide. In fact, at last count, this was kind of astonishing to me, there are 750,000 people worldwide that are registered for lean startup meetup groups in 81 different countries. Now, what could account for this passion? Well, it turns out that the way that Eric was able to come up with this, um, he was a startup employee and was frustrated, as many people before him have been, that you put so much time, so much effort into creating a startup, and yet so many of them fail. And he wanted to really try to solve the problem. Is there a way that we can make startups more successful? Is there a way that, even by a bit, that we could, that we could tamp down this failure rate and make it more likely that the startup and all of the blood and sweat and money and tears that go into it can thrive? And so there's a lot of ways you could look at that, a lot of ways you could try to solve that problem. But what Eric did, which is part of why it became so successful and such a phenomenon, is he looked in what I would argue is perhaps the most unlikely place, lean manufacturing. I mean, when we think about lean, this is the ultimate industrial era process, right? It's how do you improve manufacturing on an assembly line? And yet, he saw flashes in it of a way that it could be applied to the ethereal world of Silicon Valley startups. He saw a mashup where other people wouldn't have and applied the ideas in new ways that enabled people to say, oh, this is how we do it. As a result, he's influenced generations of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. I say generations because much like you know, breeding mice or, or whatever, uh, it's, it's like 10 generations within three years. <laughs> so, but it comes from this question of how do you bring together unlikely suspects and see what they can teach each other? Lean and startups has created a phenomenon. So the first strategy that I talk about in Standout, as exemplified by the, the two Eric's, is finding ways to bring together disciplines, to mix perspectives, and to innovate as a result. The second, this is uh, a professor at Columbia Business School. I'm actually going to be hanging out with her tomorrow. Uh, her name is Rita McGrath. Um, I'm going to be, uh, she's, she's teaching a week-long executive education class on innovation. Uh, right now and uh, tomorrow, I'm, I'm, fl I'm flying back tonight to New York and tomorrow I'm going to be uh, teaching a workshop for this innovation course about many of these concepts. And so Rita is um, recognized, there's a, an entity called Thinkers 50 and Thinkers 50, every two years they create a ranking of the world's top business thinkers. Rita is actually number six on the list currently. Uh, she is considered one of the world's top uh, strategy thinkers. And a big part of the reason is that a couple of years ago she wrote a book called The End of Competitive Advantage. And what she talks about in this book is something that probably has been on many of your minds as well, which is the fact that it seems like we, we are all noticing that the pace of disruption is accelerating. I mean, we know companies that have been 
uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies or companies that have been on the, the S&P 500, the, the time that they are holding these positions is dramatically de decreasing. We see a ton of churn. You guys probably all had, had Blackberries in 2007. I'm willing to bet you probably don't today. You all probably used to shop it at Borders, in Circuit City. I'm really willing to bet you don't today. <laughs> So what do you do? I mean, we all know disruption is in the air. We know that it's happening. What do you do about it? Well, Rita McGrath wrote a book that was essentially a playbook answering that question. What do you do about disruption? And what she came up with was you know, a lot of useful and tangible suggestions. Things like, instead of doing annual budgeting, as people have so often done, Switch it to quarterly budgeting, because we need to be able to innovate and pivot faster. Things like that. If we look at the concept of disruption, this is something everyone's talking about, everyone's concerned about, but no one knows what to do about it. If you are willing to lean into a problem that everyone's facing, a big, worthy challenge, you are going to get a disproportionate share of attention simply because everyone is already so attuned to what you are talking about and doing. My challenge to you is how can we address the biggest problems in our field? In Silicon Valley, there, you, know, you hear venture capitalists complaining all the time now about people, you know, entrepreneurs who are coming to them with these safe, small bets. Oh, it's, it's the Uber for window washing. It's the Uber for shoe shines. It's the Uber for bicycles. Great, nice. But what we need instead is not incrementalism. What we need sometimes is to attack the most important problem. If we can do that, even if we fall short, that is a worthy challenge that will get you noticed that will get the passion and buy-in of our customers and our employees. What is the most worthy challenge that we can be addressing now? Another strategy, which for many thinkers has been valuable, and I'll say too, this is, this is not uh, a prescription where in order to have a big idea or a breakthrough idea, you have to literally do all of these things. This is more of a smorgasbord, right? Um, many of these, these thinkers, you pick one, you pick the thing that seems the most relevant to you and your business circumstances and you go deep on that. So another strategy that has been valuable is the niche strategy. And one of the people that I talked to uh, in creating Standout was this guy. Um, his name is Sopal Ear. And today he is a professor at Occidental College in Los Angeles, which is actually where I just uh, came from um, Monday morning, yesterday morning, I flew out of LA after being there on my book tour. But he didn't start out there. When he was a baby, he was less than a year old, his mother fled the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. And she had five children. And amazingly, she was able to get them all to safety. First, they were refugees in France. And then eventually, they made their way to the United States, to California. And so Paul grew up. He was um, a talented student and he eventually got his doctorate in political economy at Berkeley. Now, in the world of academia, you, you get the most attention, you get the most uh, plaudits if you study a field that is sexy, right? Because, you know, much like how Google works, Google was actually created based on, uh, you know, and inspired on the system of academic citations. The more you're cited, the more valuable and important you're considered to be. So if you want to juice this process in academia, if you really want to uh, maximize your chances of getting tenure, it pays to focus on a topic that everyone's already talking about. Like, you know, if you're doing political economy, maybe it's China, maybe it's Brazil, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's India. But so Paul had a different agenda for himself. He really wanted to understand his homeland and what had happened to his homeland. And so he became an expert in Cambodia. He wrote his dissertation about foreign aid in Cambodia and, uh, and became an expert in that. And you might think if that's where the story ends, okay, well, that's great. You know, that's somebody who knows a lot about a little thing, but 
I'm not sure how many universities there are that say, oh, we must have a Cambodianist. What he learned, what he realized, is that it is important and powerful to have a niche, to own that niche. But what he told me is, Cambodia is one door. Cambodia is the first door. But you open that, you walk down the hallway, and there are other doors that you can open. So for him, it turns out, uh, in the course of becoming an expert in Cambodia, he also studied Southeast Asian livestock. Now that might actually sound pretty random, but it turns out that when the avian flu epidemic broke out a number of years ago, he was actually one of the few experts that could speak knowledgeably about the state of livestock in that part of the world. And so he got called on by the news media and became recognized as an avian flu expert. In fact, he recently gave a, uh, a popular TED talk, which if you guys are interested, you can Google, about criminal justice, which might also seem incredibly far afield from what he has studied until you realize that because of his knowledge of Cambodia, he had become an expert in criminal justice because of his study of the Khmer Rouge tribunals. If you own a niche and you stay with that niche forever, then yes, it's a career limiting move. But what Sopal shows is that if you can niche down and then use that strategically to open other doors, to move into adjacent areas, it can be a very powerful tool for you personally as a professional and for your company. There's a phenomenon in psychology known as the halo effect. And what this says basically is that if you become known by people as being really good in one area, they will actually tend to generalize and say, oh, well, she must be great in all kinds of areas. And it gives you the freedom and the flexibility once you've got that toehold to be able to explore. You have the connections. You know, if, if So Paul gets called up to, uh, to talk about avian flu by a television producer or a newspaper editor, and then a few months later, he has an interesting insight about criminal justice, they already know who he is. They already know he's good on camera or that he's a good writer. And they're far more willing to give him a chance to talk about that other thing if he can make a good case about it. So developing a niche strategy, niching down, is one of the best ways that we can begin to really own our terrain as a company and then think about what are the adjacent areas that we can begin to leverage and to move into. This is a woman named Rose Schumann. She also actually lives in Los Angeles, and I had dinner with her on Friday. But she's someone that I profile in Stand Out. I first became aware of her um, years ago. I read an article in the New York Times about her work. And uh, imagine my surprise a few months after that when I met her at a conference. And so we, we got to know each other a bit. And I thought her story was so interesting, I wanted to be sure to include her in Stand Out. When she was 18 years old, Rose, who had grown up in suburban Maryland, took a family trip. It was a family vacation to uh, Nicaragua to visit her stepmother's relatives. Her stepmom was, was from there originally. When Rose went down there, she almost didn't know how to make sense of what she was seeing. She'd grown up in this comfortable suburban life, and when they get to Nicaragua, it's shortly after the end of the Contra War. There's poverty everywhere. The systems, the institutions are in disarray. Literally, there is one functional street light in the entire country. When she saw that, it affected her so much, she said, this is what I want to do. These are the people I want to help. And so she, she did. She went to college, and she studied international development. It became her passion. And after she graduated, she joined an international NGO. As part of this international NGO, she was traveling around, spending a lot of time on the ground in different countries. And one day, she was, she was walking around, musing about a topic that a lot of people in the international development world have grappled with, which is, how do you bring the power of the internet to the world's poorest people? Now, many of you have probably heard of 
the One Laptop Per Child initiative. That got a lot of press a number of years ago. Um, you know, you create these cheap laptops, give them to kids. It's a good idea. But when Rose was thinking about that, which at the time was really the primary solution, there's a lot of steps, she realized. First of all, you've got to figure out how to manufacture the laptops cheaply, which was not easy. Next, you have to make sure that the laptops can, can stay powered, that they you know, have a power source. You have to make sure that the people who have them have a safe place to store them. You also have to make sure that the people who are using them are literate, which is not in any way a foregone conclusion if you're talking about the poorest people in the world. You also have to make sure they're literate in a language that exists on the internet because for many of these people who are rural villagers, they speak tiny languages that there's almost no information online in. Then they have to figure out how to use the computer. Then they might search and something good might happen. She realized that was a lot of steps. She wondered if there was a way that she could shortcut that somehow, create a, create a life hack. Is there any way to bring the internet faster to people? And as she was thinking about this, she was walking around and her eyes lit upon something that she had seen many times before, but it never struck her with the clarity that she experienced in that moment. She saw a call box like you'd see at a transit station or maybe on a college campus. You push a button and you ask someone a question and they answer you. And she realized that could be it. You could access the power of the internet without even understanding what the internet was. She spent the next four, four hours writing in her journal furiously, coming up with the ideas, plotting it out. And she spent the next 10 years operationalizing her vision which today is a nonprofit initiative called Question Box, which is operative in much of Africa and India, where they have these call boxes, literally. You put them in a village, people push a button, and at the other end of the line, they're connected to a bilingual interpreter in a centralized location who has a computer, and you ask the person a question, they can Google it for you and give you the answer, whatever it is, whether it's crop prices, or just something you want to know. In fact, last fall, during the Ebola outbreak in Liberia, question boxes provide, provided one of the most powerful tools available um, because all of the international aid workers had to leave. They all left the country and were evacuated. And so if you were a Liberian in a rural village and wanted to get straight up information about what was happening with the virus and how to protect yourself and your family, Question Box was actually one of the few tools that you could use to get accurate and up-to-date information. For me, what's critical about Rose's story is that, you know, again, when we think about ideas, when we talk about ideas, a lot of times people say, well, you know, that, that's, that's great, but I don't, I don't have any ideas. And, you know, my experience is, you know, I'm, I'm not able to come up with something brilliant for the company, maybe, you know, maybe an engineer, maybe a scientist, but, but not necessarily me. But what Rose's story shows us, this is an idea that came, like Daniel Goleman's, from paying attention, from seeing, truly seeing what's in front of you. And it also came, frankly, from her personal experience. She cared about these issues. She was clued into these issues because of a family vacation that she took when she was a teenager. She saw something that she wanted to change, that she wanted to fix, that she wanted to help. For all of us, we have our own unique experiences. We see things in a different way than anyone else because of where we come from, because of how we choose to spend our time, because of different experiences we've had in our professional life, in our personal life. You have a lens that no one else does, and that enables you to make connections that no one else does. If we can do that, if we can bring that lens, if we can bring our whole selves to work, we are able to make a contribution that is unique, that no one else can. We are moving, as we get to a more and more competitive economy, we are moving away from a world where the most important thing is 
how are you similar to everyone else? Do you have the same credentials? Do you have the same background? Do you fit in like everyone else? We are moving away from that world and we are moving toward a world where what people want to know is how are you different? What is the unique thing that you can contribute? This is about not being a commodity. This is about showing your unique way of looking at the world and sharing those ideas to help your company and to become recognized in the process for those ideas. Now, sometimes when people think about breakthrough ideas, they also think that it has to be some lightning strike, some bolt from the blue that comes down, you know, some muse-like inspiration. But another thing, an important thing that I realized in the course of, of doing the research for Standout is that oftentimes the best ideas don't look like that. Now for Rose, she did have a moment of inspiration, which of course took her 10 years to actualize. But for this gentleman, Michael Waxenberg, it actually happened in a very different way. He was and is an IT manager at a financial services company. And about 15 years ago, he and his family had to face a decision because they had just heard that their apartment where they were living was going to be condoized. And they had to decide whether they were gonna buy it or not. They lived in New York City, everything was expensive, everything was complicated, and they wanted to make a right decision because there was a lot of money at stake. So Michael and his wife began going to these open houses, these real estate open houses, so that they could gather information and make a good choice. Michael was a very analytical guy. He, you know, he was seeing all these properties. He wanted to keep them straight. So he started taking notes and writing very meticulous reviews of the properties. But a critical thing that he did, a lot of people would have just kept it in a notebook and that's it. It would have ended there. But what Michael did, first of all, is he made a decision to be generous with his ideas. He shared the information. He had found a website called Street Easy, a real estate website. And he decided to post his reviews there so that everybody could look at them and share them. He visited dozens and dozens of apartments. And some people had posted reviews on Street Easy, but most people, you know, they were doing this for free. This was kind of a, you know, a half-hearted thing. You know, they weren't putting time into them. Michael's were different. They were incredibly detailed, incredibly helpful reviews. And as a result, he started to get a stream of emails in. Hey, I love your reviews. Will you represent me? But the only problem was that he wasn't a realtor. He was doing this as a hobby. And so he said at first, well, you know, I'm sure I can help you. I can't sell you a property. But he would offer some advice and they would give him a box of chocolates and that would be it. But he kept writing reviews and he kept getting emails. And before long, an actual realtor, a guy who owned a firm, wrote to him and said, if you have not done this yet, I will sponsor you to become a realtor you already have a client base. And so Michael went through the training and did become a realtor. And today, he, he's never wanted to leave his job, but today he has a very lucrative second job that he does for fun, that he doesn't have to market at all because people come to him on the strength of his reviews and on the strength of the second and third generation referrals of the people that he initially served from those Street Easy reviews. He wasn't looking to create a new income stream or a new career for himself. He was just looking to keep things straight for himself and to be helpful to other people in the process. You don't necessarily have to come to your big idea with top-down thinking about, you know, what, what are the strategic trends and the implications for the next 20 years? Sometimes you can come to your big idea. You can come to your next product line, your next service that you offer, the next breakthrough that is going to take your company to the next level by iterating, by starting, by doing, by doing something small, by getting out there and rolling up your sleeves, getting into the trenches, doing research, testing things out. For Michael, it's created an incredibly satisfying and money-making endeavor. There's a author named Steven Johnson, who wrote a book called Where Good Ideas Come From. And he talks about what he calls the power of the slow hunch. 
in the power of the slow hunch, he, the case study that he cites is Charles Darwin. Turns out that how Darwin came up with, uh, with his theory of evolution, it was not in a flash of insight. It was something that literally, in reading his journals, he hashed over for months. He had it almost right, almost right, almost right, but not quite, not quite there. But it was a slow hunch that iterated and evolved. And for a lot of us, I think that's, that's the way. We sometimes hold ourselves back because we think, oh, we have to have the flash of inspiration. You don't. Sometimes you get the ideas by simply doing the work. Some of you may, uh, may recognize this guy or uh, have, have uh, bought his books or use his products. This is David Allen of Getting Things Done fame. Uh, he's somebody that I interviewed for Stand Out. And the, the final strategy that I want to share with you guys before a little, a little wrap up is the strategy of creating a framework and how this can be helpful when it comes to creating powerful ideas. There are a lot of productivity experts. Probably, you know, you know some of them. There's a lot of people talking about how do you be more effective, how do you be more efficient. Why has David Allen, of all of these people, become so popular, so dominant? He has a million Twitter followers. He's, he's been on the bestseller list forever with getting things done. Why? Well, it turns out that in many fields, it's important to create a framework. And what I mean by that is that I think a lot of times we assume that whatever we're doing has, has probably, it's all been done, right? That, you know, the, the, the central precepts of our field or the central, uh, you know, problems that we're grappling with, it's, it's all been laid out before. But the truth is sometimes there are breakthroughs and explanatory devices that are waiting to happen that no one has really done. We all know plenty of tactics for, uh, for doing you know, productivity, being more effective. David Allen talks about some of them. If you can do something like answer an email in two minutes or less, you should do it right then. That's a good productivity tip. If you, um, David Allen is an advocate of things like, uh, if you have to do a bunch of phone calls, batch them and create a list of where you can do phone calls so that if you're uh, being driven to the airport in a cab, you, you'll have the list, you can bang out all your phone calls. Those are great tactics. Lots of people have tactics. But very few people have frameworks. And because David Allen was able to create a framework so that you can really understand the big picture of productivity, it's stuck with people in a way that others have not. If, if, you th if any of you are fans of screenwriting in movies, um, Robert McKee has made a, a very handsome living and has written numerous books, literally laying out the framework of how good screenplays um, are done. Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. Well, you know, people, people have had, had needs forever, but it took Maslow to be able to, to think about, to create it, to create that structure. Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. We've had myths for as long as people have existed, and yet no one had really explained the structure of a myth. The challenge for all of us is, is there a way, through perhaps making more time for reflection, to get that 30,000 foot view on our industry or on the problems that our industry is solving? Is there a way that we can begin to explain in a different or clearer or better way those challenges? Because if we can do that, if we can articulate the problems or the challenges better, like David Allen has done, it ensures that we are known for our ideas and when people think about our industry, when people think about the challenges they're facing, they think of us. But how does this all come into play? What do we need to, to be doing? As I've mentioned, first, it's about having powerful ideas, being open to them, being willing to, to look around, to pay attention, to, you know, even if only briefly, to turn off the smartphones and to make those connections. Next, it's about sharing those ideas, being generous with expressing them, putting them out there, letting like-minded people, letting customers, letting potential talent that might join our team find us because they see how we think and they like how we think. But the final ingredient that I will leave you with is something that 
I learned about a couple of years ago. My friend Anthony Chan, along with a couple of co-authors, wrote a book called Hearts, Smarts, Guts, and Luck. And Tony's a VC, and he wanted to study what makes entrepreneurs successful. And I will take the liberty of extending this to most professionals and executives because I think the same principles hold. What he discovered with all of these interviews, long, you know, qualitative interviews, is that for the most successful entrepreneurs, there are four types that really uh, people fall into. Heart-driven entrepreneurs who succeed because of their passion. Smarts-driven entrepreneurs who are just so brainy, they, they power their way through the problems and succeed. There's guts-driven entrepreneurs who they might face rejection a hundred times, but they still keep going. We, we probably all know people like that. We can say, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But the part that didn't initially make sense to me, the part that I wanted to probe, was the fourth category. A full quarter of the people were so-called luck-driven entrepreneurs. What does that mean? The luck-driven entrepreneurs, these were not people who just, you know, oh, they're the slackers and they just got lucky. It turns out that luck is an attitude that we can cultivate. It's post facto. It is later on that we identify something as luck because we can see how the connections have all fit together. But in the moment, the people who are the lucky entrepreneurs, the ones that bring luck into their lives, the way that they manifest it is by having an attitude that is a combination of curiosity plus humility. You and I have probably all been to events where we're talking to somebody at the cocktail party and you can see their eyes start to go up and over and scan the room looking for more important people to talk to. It's rude, but in addition to being rude, it's unlucky. Because if you are so tightly focused on one goal, I have to meet that person, or I have to meet that type of person, it means that almost by definition, you are going to be closing yourself off to serendipitous opportunities, of talking to the person that seems like the least likely person in the room, of talking to the wallflower, of talking to the person that maybe dressed differently, of talking to the person who maybe looks differently, Maybe they're the older person in a room full of young people or the young person in a room full of older people. Almost everyone else will overlook that person. And if you are willing to be curious enough to say, let's see how this unfolds, and if you are humble enough to say, I know I can learn from this person, then you are going to disproportionately benefit from those connections that no one else sees. That is part of how we can have powerful ideas in our lives. And with that, I'm going to open up. If you have thoughts, comments, questions, I'm really excited to be here talking with you. Thank you so much. Feel free, anyone, to, to dive in if you'd like. I know Russ was talking to me that he had, he had some thoughts. We'll give you a chance first, but if not, I'll go to my man, Russ. All right, let's go to you. Fantastic. So the question is, if you have numerous ideas, how do you pick? How do you know where to focus so you're not spreading yourself too thin? This is an important question. Um, I, I know one of the things that I talk about in Standout is the fact that uh, for a lot of people, and in fact, I would include myself in this category, uh, you know, if, if you're a little bit of a renaissance person where you have a lot of interest, you have a lot of ideas, it can be almost painful to, to say, oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick this one. And so my answer to that actually is not to pick. And I will tell you what I mean by that. Um, clearly, there has to be some, uh, some you know, uh, separation of the wheat from the chaff, but you don't necessarily have to do it. Um, the way that I got the contract for my first book, it was called Reinventing You, I realized um, that if I was going to get published, I needed to, uh, you know, the, the term they use is build a platform. 
Uh, basically, that means you have to become reasonably well known uh, so that they are, the publishers are willing to take a chance on publishing a book by you. So I started blogging, which is you know, one of the ways that they suggest to do platform building. So I started writing for the Harvard Business Review. And the second post that I ever wrote for them was called How to Reinvent Your Personal Brand. And this was not in any way meant to be my definitive statement about life. This was, uh, this was really uh, just one of many blog posts that I had done uh, and, and would do subsequently. But that particular post became popular. And it seemed to resonate with people. And so the editors at Harvard Business Review reached out to me and asked me if I would be willing to turn the blog post into a magazine piece. And so I, I said, sure. So I turned, I turned it around into a 2,500 word magazine piece. When the magazine piece came out, I got approached by three different literary agents who said, would you like to turn this into a book? Would you like to have a conversation about that? Now, I had been trying literally for, for years before that to get a book published and was just hitting walls. I was not having any luck. And all of a sudden, this, it was coming to me, finally. And I realized the power of putting small bets out into the marketplace and seeing what would stick and seeing where the traction was. And so I said, sure. And I, I talked to the agents, got an agent, wrote a proposal. And ultimately, in 2013, my first book, Reinventing You, came out from Harvard Business Review Press, stand out as my second book. So what I will suggest for people who have a lot of ideas, you know, if they're in the, in the fortunate position of, of being idea machines, um, you don't necessarily have to make a decision. Because frankly, we often don't know what the marketplace is going to want or be interested in. What I will suggest is to find ways to do small pilots, small tests, you know, something where you are limiting your losses. Uh, you know, maybe uh, you know, if, if it's about what book should I write, it's you know, writing a bunch of blog posts and seeing what gains traction. If it's about products, um, maybe it is uh, you know, cr creating small tests, whether it's a, a pilot in a certain market. Maybe it's even, you know, a, as is often the case in, uh, in the software world, advertising a product um, and, and trying to sell it prior to creating it to actually see if anyone orders it. And, you know, of course, you have to time out how long it will actually take to, uh, to create it and uh, notify people accordingly of it. But, you know, really give it a test in the marketplace so that you're limiting your downside, but you begin to get a sense of what real people care about and are interested in and go with that. Uh, if, you can, if you can let the market help you make decisions, um, then there'll be infinitely smarter decisions than most of what we can come up with on our own. So that's a great question. Thank you, Russ. Um, if, uh, if folks have it, we have time for maybe one more question. I know we want to we wanna get people out uh, at an early time and, and be respectful of everyone's time. I am happy to stick around afterwards as well to answer questions. And if you guys you know, want to ping me too um, on email, you can connect on, on LinkedIn. Um, I'll also mention for folks that are, that are interested in you know, literally working through these questions, I have a free workbook on my website. Uh, it's doryclark.com. And uh, it is literally, it's 139 questions that are adapted from Standout. Uh, and it's a workbook where you can write in. Uh, so if you want to work through creating your own breakthrough ideas and building a following, it helps you do that. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there in case anyone would like to, to download the free workbook. Uh, so last questions, thoughts? For me? <laughs> Oh, good question. Write, writing books is almost never a good way to make money. <laughs> but yes, you're exactly right. I actually, in the last section of Stand Out, I talk about, uh, I talk about how to monetize uh, thought leadership. And you know, clearly, if we're talking about it from a corporate perspective, if you're coming up with a new product or a new service, Great, you know the money is right there. It's very clear. Um, if you have a, a kind of a new economy career, so to speak, where uh, where you are trafficking in ideas, as as to a certain extent that that I do, um, one of the one of the crucial things is developing m multiple revenue streams. And so, uh, you know, it's it's a good way to hedge one's bets anyway. I mean, you guys are probably all doing this with your corporations, um, but for me, um, I'm making money from writing books, from giving speeches, from doing corporate consulting, 
from doing executive coaching and then business school teaching. So it's, I've got I've got five different uh, things plugging in, and um, you know if uh, if if the the, the spigot uh, starts to to go a little slower on some of them, you've, we've got other ones to uh, to build it up. So post uh, 2008 2009, I think diversification is a pretty good strategy for all of us. So thanks so much for asking. It's a pleasure to connect with you guys and have a great day.